Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Binu Sandhu. Let's take a look at the stories for the day. We don't know if we are going to be there for the 50th anniversary of the company. Infosys co-founder Nandan Nilekani said this on Wednesday at an event to mark four decades of the IT major. NR Narayana Murthy, who was also present at the event, echoed somewhat similar sentiments as the two founders wondered about the future course of the company, its leadership, its talent management and the overall structure. So what are the major challenges that the tech major needs to address in the next 10 years? Bhaswar Kumar and the Bhargyo Sanyal bring you the answer. Infosys founder N.R. Narayan Murthy on Wednesday said that his decision of not allowing the children of Infosys founders or the next generation of promoters to take active role in the IT major was completely wrong. Speaking at an event organized to celebrate the 40 years of Infosys, Murthy admitted that it deprived Infosys of legitimate talent. His longtime partner in the company's co-founder, Nandan Nilakani, meanwhile, said that he would hand over his role to a non-founder when he exits the company. So. Is Infosys facing a succession challenge? In fact, they don't have a succession challenge. What Nandan was saying is that they will find a non-founder chairperson to succeed him. And there is enough time. The runway between his age today and his potential retirement date is large. And whenever he believes that the reins have to be handed over, there's enough time to find a great successor. I think this is a, uh, to my mind, a very long visioned statement that Nandan and Mr. Narayan Murthy made. And they are trying to break the ground that they will look for a competent person who can fit the bill as chairman of a large company uh, like Infosys. And that's the signal that I read in all the comments. I did not get an impression that it was a knee-jerk reaction or a reactive way to deal with what happened with Mr. Sikha. Uh, so uh, to my mind, this was a positive succession planning announcement. Infosys was founded in 1981 when seven engineers from Partney Computer Systems, N.R. Narayan Murthy, Nandan Nilakani, N.S. Raghavan, S. Gopal Krishnan, S.D. Shibulal, K. Dinesh and Ashok Arora came together to launch Infosys Consultants with a modest investment of 10,000 rupees. And one of the cardinal rules which all seven co-founders had agreed upon was to never have our hand in the till, Murthy said on Wednesday. The company's uncertainty over choosing a future leader comes in the midst of a challenging time for the IT industry. A quick look at the performance of top-tier IT services players in the first quarter of this financial year, or Q1 FI23, shows that they are still far away from getting a grip on managing attrition. Infosys's margins came in at 20.1% for the first quarter, lower than its range of 21 to 23%. The management said the compensation impact during this quarter was 160 basis points, while the street was expecting it to be in the range of 75 to 100 basis points. Moreover, with the current war for talent and the struggle that the IT industry is going through to add people and meet demands, suggests that the quest for non-linear revenue remains an elusive target for most major players, including Infosys. Nilakani and Murthy's concerns regarding succession comes after Infosys's first attempt at this, with Vishal Sikka as the first non-co-founder CEO, so a bitter end. Sikka resigned following a tumultuous three-year tenure and saw Nilakani return in 2017. To the core characteristics of the organization or that for provide the foundation of the organization. So th that has to be retained. So the, uh, the person who is going to uh, replace must have basically shared in 
the same kind of values, same kind of uh, capabilities or more capabilities, and that are required to take the organization to the next level. So in terms of the values, in terms of the characters, in terms of the respect for what has been done in the past must be there. It is very important that whoever is coming in has the stewardship values, means that that person is coming here as uh, someone who is here, who has been inherited with the values, inherited with that, an organization of this kind of a caliber, capabilities. And that responsibility of the new leader is to preserve, protect, build on it and pass it over to the next generation. It also turns the attention to the current CEO, Salil Parik, who brought Infosys back to its growth fundamentals as the firm has surpassed its closest rival and peer, Tata Consultancy Services. Since Parik began his strategic review more than four years back, he has been able to improve his targeted four core focus areas – agile digital business, energizing the core, reskilling, and localization. Not only that, Parikh seems to have balanced his relationship with the founders too. The recent statements by the co-founders also indicate a sharp move away from the core philosophy of keeping the company away from familial succession lines. And this might even have implication for the overall structure of the IT giant in the future. Uh, I, I tend to disagree with uh, Mr. Murthy. So the reason is that from the very beginning, uh, they've kept the ownership and the management capabilities as different. So if the organization has to be successful, it needs the right talent, right capabilities, right culture, right values, and right leadership. And that doesn't come automatically just because somebody is inheriting shares. And organizations should not be considered as employment exchanges. And therefore, what is required is to make sure that the professional is managing the organization, professionally capable uh, person. And one of the biggest challenges we face, find in the Indian context in large family controlled businesses or partner controlled businesses is that when family members or promoters are operationally involved, there are always challenges of keeping them together. If you hand over to somebody the responsibility and it doesn't work out, there is no plan B. I can't come back at the age of 75. This statement by Nilakani, despite the steady sales maintained under Parikh's stewardship, does seem to ring a warning note for the tech giants' future. However, as experts point out, more than a warning, this might actually be a call to the company's management to begin headhunting in advance with an eye on adapting to the changing IT market. Nandan Nilikani also advised against practicing reverse discrimination. Moving on, with 70 games played and two left, the FIFA World Cup has entered the final lap. While the tournament in Qatar is being hailed for several firsts, it is also drawing criticism. The country's treatment of migrant workers and allegation of corruption are inviting as much attention as the action on the field. Now, what makes this Football World Cup so unique? Debarja Sanyal looks at the scorecard. In an event which has been full of so many upsets, seeing Messi and Mbappe in action during the Sunday's final will be a relief of sorts for their fans especially for the lovers of Argentina, whose loss to Saudi Arabia in the first match is now being seen as a turning point for it. It won the next five games to reach the final of FIFA World Cup 2022. But even as we wait for the two sorcerers to cast their spell one last time in this World Cup in Qatar, 
the series in its entirety has had plenty of magical moments to seal a unique place in the history of the game. The first football World Cup to be held in the Middle East, it will also be the shortest when it wraps up on December 18. Also, for the first time in the history of the Cup, to avoid the intense Qatar summer heat that can reach as high as 48 degrees centigrade, the event is being played in winter. Even then, all World Cup stadiums are equipped with cooling systems that aim to reduce temperatures within the stadium by up to 20 degrees centigrade. Speaking of stadiums, six of the eight venues, such as the venue for the final Lucille Stadium, were new stadiums built specifically for the 2022 FIFA World Cup. The construction of these stadiums alone cost the oil-rich nation $6.5 billion. There are also rail lines to connect all stadiums. When a game ended at 4 p.m., for example, a fan could easily go to another stadium through Metroline for a match that starts at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. But not all stadiums will be left standing once the caravan has left town. Take, for instance, the Stadium 974 or Ras Abu Abod Stadium. Opened on November 30, 2021, the temporary venue is made from 974 recycled shipping containers. It is already being dismantled and is designed to be reassembled elsewhere. Overall, Qatar has spent a whopping $220 billion in organizing the event. In comparison, Russia had spent only $14.2 billion to organize the 2018 World Cup. This is a really unique World Cup because unlike every other country, or well, I'm going to discount Japan and South Korea here in 2002, but most countries that host the World Cup actually have a footballing legacy. And they have stadiums, they have clubs, they have infrastructure developed around football that exists prior to the World Cup coming there. But Qatar, it's completely new. Just take, for example, the Lusayle Stadium, which will host the World Cup final. In 2011, uh, when Qatar hosted the AFC Asian Cup, that stadium did not exist. That city did not exist. They have built that city up from scratch and that's stadium is just one of the small things that has been part of a large infrastructure branding project. When you hold, when you get the hosting rights for a World Cup, there's a lot of sponsorship that immediately follows. But to be fair, Qatar did not need any of that. Okay, Qatar is a completely self-financed. This whole project is self-financed. $200 billion worth of infrastructure development. It's all been... And I can tell you how little this sponsorship matters to them just from the fact that one day, the evening before the World Cup was supposed to kick off, FIFA's biggest financial partners, sponsors for the World Cup are Budweiser. Qatar said, we're not going to let you sell Budweiser. But way before the eight stadiums of Qatar came alive to the clapping and cheering of the crowd, they were host to thousands of migrants from Philippines, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, etc. According to Amnesty International, migrant workers form 90% of Qatar's total workforce. After winning the bid to host the World Cup in 2010, Qatar embarked on a massive construction exercise. Everything was built from the scratch, including all the stadiums, barring one, which was also redeveloped. According to Western media, thousands of migrant workers died during this construction frenzy. Qatar's last-minute ban on alcohol in the stadiums was also a walk back on one of the two crucial commitments they had made in their hosting bid. The other was the allowance of pride flags. Already under fire, their intolerance for LGBTQ rights, the controversy came to a head when security officials at stadiums confiscated items of rainbow clothing, flags featuring rainbows, whether pride-related or not, and reportedly intimidated fans. Right after Qatar won the rights to host the cup, allegations of corruption within the FIFA senior officials raised the possibility that Qatar bought the 2022 World Cup through bribery via Mohammed bin Haman, who was president of the Asian Football Confederation at the time. Qatar has denied these allegations. And now, two days before the final, Vice President of the European Parliament, the Greek socialist Eva Kaili, has been arrested as part of a wider investigation into alleged bribes paid to members of the Brussels Assembly 
to improve the public image of Qatar. But controversies apart, this event will also belong to underdogs who lit up the event, both on the field and off it. With performances by Morgan Freeman, Jungkook from BTS, Nicki Minaj, Trinidad Cardona and Nora Fatehi, the opening ceremony and the official soundtrack underlined Qatar's implicit message and theme for this World Cup. From the dominance of Asian brands on its billboards and sponsorship cards to the inclusion of artists from across Asia and Africa in the soundtrack, promotional videos and the opening ceremony, the hosts have presented an impressive showcase of Asian soft power and culture and it reflected in the field too. Also, we saw an Asian team. Many of these Asian teams took down some European and South American heavyweights. It's obviously a step up for Asian football. Um, it's a big deal because for us as India, if we are looking to get inspired, then I think at the very basic level, most of our grassroots work is done to complement the Asian structure and we follow the Asian Confederation. So it's a really proud moment for us. Indeed, despite the controversies and flamboyance, football regained its spotlight this World Cup. With a plethora of closely contested games, plenty of upsets and Morocco becoming the first African nation to race into the semi-finals, the series have proved to be a football fan's delight. The most unique thing is that wonderful matches. We have seen some great matches. I think in my memory, I have not seen, I, I can't recall having so many well contested, keenly contested matches in a World Cup. There has been several World Cups which have been very sloppy in terms of uh, competitiveness, one-sided, <clears throat> sometimes very predictable, but it has not been this time. This is, I think it's a, it's a from the sporting point of view, it's a huge, huge success. Well, I think this is this this has been a this has been a smooth World Cup without an incident. Uh, Morocco alone carries everybody on their shoulders. The way they have played and an African team has reached the semi-finals. You don't need anything else to amplify the success of this World Cup. One Morocco is enough to amplify the success, I think. <laughs> While each edition of the World Cup has had its fair share of controversies, the newly erupted Qatar Gate scandal threatens to throw a bigger shadow on not only Qatar's lavish display of its wealth off-field, but also the robust footballing action on-field that had so far made this World Cup really unique. Not just Qatar, a lot has been happening in India's media sector as well. While Z and Sony are set to become a single entity in about six months from now, the Adani Group has forayed into the sector with the NDTV acquisition. Meanwhile, the sector recently received regulatory fillip from the government. But are these triggers enough to sustain the rally in related stocks? How should investors pick media related stocks? Nikita Vasisht offers the answers in this report. TV broadcasters have been amidst a storm over the past few years. While OTT streaming services chipped away their audiences, curtailed ad spend amid the pandemic took a large portion of their revenue. If this wasn't enough, a new tariff order threw a spanner in the works. The tide, however, is turning. The Telecom Regulatory Authority of India has now amended the tariff order. It has reversed the price cap of bouquet channels from 12 rupees per month to 19 rupees per month and allowed broadcasters to offer bouquet discount of up to 45% as against 33% proposed earlier. According to JM Financial, Revision in the price cap takes away a material risk to subscription revenue estimates and offers broadcasters room to balance price increase versus subscriber growth equation. Channel checks indicate that TV has held on to its share of ad spends as OTT viewership remains cornered by a handful of premium customers. That said, the sector is seeing increased mergers and acquisitions to counter competition from streaming platforms. In fourth quarter, I guess that it is about to get completed. 
and uh, that is one of the reasons because that will become a big media behemoth uh, and uh, they will be uh, commanding a big uh, uh, you know market share and the uh, dynamics also in the media broadcasting sector is go- are going to change because uh, they being uh, the market leader c- commanding about 30% of the market share viewership market share other companies are also you know uh, getting uh, heated up like the NDTV uh, and uh, the, the Adani is getting into the NDTV business and uh, the network 18, 18 also uh, being uh, with Reliance and you know that uh, uh, some mergers and some consolidations are happening within the media sector. So you know two to three big uh, names are emerging out of uh, uh, these, these mergers that are happening and I think that uh, competition is also going to be uh, stiff going forward. On the bourses, the Nifty Media Index has rallied 14% on the National Stock Exchange over the past six months. In comparison, the benchmark Nifty 50 Index has risen 19% during the period. Individually, NDTV, Sun TV Network and Z Entertainment surged between 18 and 95.5%. Analysts suggest investors track those companies that are expanding their business to put forward all kinds of content. With these consolidations taking place, the competition remains in the hands of few. Investors should be watchful of companies which are consistently increasing their reach and expanding its business to put forward all kinds of content, from sports to movies to originals. But one should also be looking out for companies that end up investing heavily. Though these may yield positive results in the long run, the premium paid for such investments is not justifiable and causes the financials to come under pressure. Patil of LKP Securities believes Z offers an attractive entry point at current levels while JM Financial and Newvama Institutional Equities have buy ratings on Z and Sun TV. NDTV, TV18 Broadcast and Network18 Media too may see decent gains amid positive sentiments, analysts said. As regards today, markets will look to stabilize after over 1% fall yesterday. The Sensex index cracked nearly 900 points yesterday to close below 61,800. The Nifty 50, meanwhile, shut shop just above 18,400. Global queues will continue to dominate the sentiment today. After financial markets, let us shift our focus to the country's security. On the 9th of December, Indian soldiers foiled an attempted transgression by Chinese troops across the border in the Tawang area of Arunachal Pradesh. But several troops from both sides were injured in the scuffle. Soon, a flag meeting was called to bring the situation under control. Now, what is a flag meeting and what happens at the meeting? Take a look. A recent face-off at Arunachal Pradesh Tawang sector was one among the many clashes between Indian and Chinese armies. On June 15 last year, armies of the two neighbours witnessed a violent clash at Ladakh's Galwan Valley, each accusing the other of transgressing the line of actual control. Border clashes with hostile Pakistan are also not uncommon. But when tensions flare, a flag meeting between the local commanders of the warring armies has always proven an effective first step to start the disengagement process. The mutual consensus to disengage is usually followed by a series of meetings and diplomatic talks that results in a stalemate. So what are flag meetings? Flag meetings are held by the commanders of two armies to discuss and resolve a conflict situation at the line of actual control. When standoffs are of a similar scale, flag meetings are held at the brigadier level of commanders. If the conflict escalates, flag meetings are held between the generals. At a predetermined time, both military commanders reach the border with their respective escort troops. Usually, a soldier among the troop holds a white flag to suggest peace. A table is then laid out to discuss the situation and attempt de-escalation. The table for the discussion is on one of the territories of armies, but closer to the border. It can also be held in the no-man's land. Usually, the country with the upper hand holds the meetings in their part of the land that is closer to the border. The topic of discussion remains strictly about the specific dispute at hand in the region. 
the larger differences between the neighbors and diplomatic affairs cannot be discussed in flag meetings. Thus, it is a tactical measure taken to diffuse the tension at the local level. Fanfares like marching troops and bugles are not a part of flag meetings. The Indian Army often takes part in flag meetings with its neighboring armies across its long border with China, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Where borders are treacherous and neighbors are nuclear weapon states, strategic interventions like flag meetings have always proven effective. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Tawang is culturally important for India too. It houses the second largest Tibetan Buddhist monastery in the world after the Putala Palace. That's all for today. For more news and analysis, please log into our website www.business-standard.com and we'll see you on Monday morning. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.